Welcome back. In chapter 11, we're going to talk about the role of capital in economic growth. And what we're going to see is that capital is extremely important in determining the level of output in an economy. So economies with more capital per worker will produce more than economies with less capital per worker. Um, but we're also going to find that long run economic growth actually can't depend on uh, capital. And the reason for that is that eventually we get to a point where adding more capital uh, actually decreases consumption. And of course, eventually you would be you know, saving all of your income in order to invest and add capital in the economy and you wouldn't be consuming anything. And so uh, in chapter 12, what we're going to do is introduce the idea of technology and technological growth. And we're going to see that that is really the source of uh, long run economic growth. But that said, we really need to understand um, the role of capital in uh, economic output and in some ways in economic growth in order to see why it's both really important, but also not the uh, long run solution to economic growth. So in order to do that, we can sort of think about what the capital stock is. So remember that capital is everything that is used to produce more goods and services. So that's everything from factories and machines and robots to trucks and computers and land. Um, and one thing that's important to understand is how we add to the capital stock, right? And we said that investment, our I in the equation for GDP, C plus I plus G, uh, is what adds to the capital stock, right? And we divided that up into two pieces, business investment uh, and residential investment. Um, and we also said that our IS relationship uh, comes from the fact that investment equals savings. And so in order to add to the capital stock in a closed economy, you need to save. And that savings then gets invested. Um, but at the same time, using your capital stock also leads to depreciation, right? So factories get older, machines get worn out, uh, computers get worn out, and eventually they need to be replaced. And so on the one hand, we've got savings and investment. And on the other hand, we've got depreciation. And whether or not the capital stock is going up or down depends on how those two are related. Um, so if we think about the savings ratio, right, um, how much of the saving, how much of GDP or gross domestic income is uh, saved, uh, that can vary a lot depending on the uh, economy, right? So it says the U.S. savings ratio is averaged only about 17 percent uh, in the United States since 1970, 22 percent in Germany and 30 percent in Japan. It's even higher in China. Um, that said, you know, the model we're going to focus on here is for a closed economy and none of those economies are closed. And one of the reasons that the U.S. savings uh, ratio is lower um, is that a lot of investment comes into the United States from overseas. Um, but so we want to think about the role of savings and investment in determining the capital stock and therefore in determining output per worker, um, as we showed in Chapter 10. Our production function says that more capital per worker will lead to more output per worker. So if we need more capital in order to produce more output, then that's obviously going to depend on how much we invest, right? And if we invest more, our capital per worker will increase. If we invest less, our capital per worker uh, may decrease. And really what that depends on is how much is depreciating every year, right? So if we have 10% of our capital stock depreciating every year, we need to at least replace that in order to keep uh, the capital stock the same. And if we uh, want to increase the capital stock, then we'll need to uh, invest more than that in order to increase the capital stock. So more savings leads to more investment, more investment leads to more capital, more capital leads to more output. And so we'll talk about that. The interesting point that we're going to sort of get to at the end of the chapter is that there's one point sort of one level of capital per worker that maximizes consumption and once you start saving more than that then save consumption is actually going to go down uh, and so we'll talk about that as well 
So this is just a way to sort of think about the capital stock, right? The capital stock itself is a stock variable, obviously not a flow variable, um, but it is going to impact our flow variables, right? And so output or income is a flow variable. Savings and investment is a flow variable. And then how that and depreciation is a flow variable. And so savings and investment and depreciation are going to determine the change in the capital stock. And then that's going to affect the capital stock in the next year. And so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to think about how does capital change over year? And then how does that affect um, output uh, and therefore savings? All right. So our production function from chapter 10 was just that output per worker is some function of capital per worker, right? And we can write it, we usually write it with a little f um, in terms of capital per worker. Sometimes you'll even see um, like capital per worker written as a little k and output per worker written as a little y. And the understanding is that the lowercase letters uh, represent per worker numbers and the capital letters represent total numbers. Um, so we're going to assume for the moment that population is constant. And so we're going to have the same amount of workers every year and we're not going to have any technological progress. And these are the two assumptions that we're going to relax in chapter 12. So if we want to increase output per worker, we need to increase capital per worker, right? Higher capital per worker will lead to higher output per worker. But we know that it is, you know, at a decreasing rate, right? It's a concave production function. So we also have a closed economy, right? Which means that investment is equal to savings, private savings plus public savings. And for the moment, in order to focus on private savings, we'll assume that public savings is zero so that the government has a balanced budget, right? Taxes are equal to government spending. Um, that's not a huge assumption, and but I think it's important um, in this case, especially in a closed economy, uh, because it simplifies things greatly. And then we're going to say, okay, well, how much do we save as an economy? Well, we're going to save some percentage of our income, and we'll call that little s. Uh, so lowercase s times output is equal to private savings. And we can think of that little s as like 1 minus c1, right? Because we know 1 minus c1 is the, the propensity to save. This will give us total savings. And so investment now is equal to private savings, which is just equal to little s times y. So investment is proportional to output. When we when output goes up, we invest more. When output goes down, we invest less. But also, if S changes, then we can invest more or less, right? So if the savings rate goes up, we invest more. If the savings rate goes down, we invest less. We also need to think about depreciation. And so for depreciation, we're going to use uh, the lowercase delta. So our depreciation um, is delta. So if we think about the way that the capital stock changes from one year to the next, then so we start with KT, right? That's the capital stock at the beginning of the year. Some of it breaks, say 10%. So at the end of the year, we have one minus delta times KT. So that might be 90% of KT. And then whatever we invested that year gets added to the capital stock. So that's IT. So this equation is saying that the capital stock next year is going to be equal to what's left of this year's capital stock, 1 minus delta times KT, plus whatever we invested this year, IT. So that's going to be important because IT we know is equal to S times YT over N. So now we have KT plus 1 over N is equal to 1 minus delta times KT over N plus S times YT over N. Now N is... Uh, constant, so we're not really worried about that too much, um, but we want to put everything in terms of uh, output and capital per worker, which is going to be important, especially in Chapter 12, when we allow population uh, to grow and technology to grow. So what we can do here is if we distribute the KTN into the 1 minus delta and then move our KTN over to the left-hand side, we get the change in the capital stock right, KT plus 1 over N minus KT over N, that's how much it changed, is equal to investment or savings, S times YT over N minus depreciation, delta times KT over N. And so this is saying, all right, savings increases the capital stock, depreciation decreases the capital stock. And now obviously one of the interesting points is where those two are going to be equal so the capital stock isn't changing. And that's what uh, we're going to focus on in a minute. 
So this is going to be really important, right? If we're saving more than is depreciating, our capital stock is going to be going up. And if we're saving less than is depreciating, our capital stock is going to be going down. And we know that output per worker is a function of capital per worker. And so output per worker will be going up and down when capital per worker is going up or down. So we can graph this here with our production function. So let's start with the blue line. So the blue line is just our production function that we had in chapter 10. So we've got capital per worker on our horizontal axis. We've got output per worker on our vertical axis. And we've got this concave production function in the blue line. Now, investment per worker is just equal to S, which is less than 1, times output per worker, right? Which is just so it's going to be the blue line times something less than 1. So it's going to be our green line here, which is just going to have the same shape as our production function, but it's going to be lower, right? It could be 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% uh, of output per worker. And then depreciation per worker is just a straight line because our horizontal axis is capital per worker, and we just multiply that by delta. That could be 5% or 10% or 15%. Um, and so that's just a straight line. And so let's think about what's going on here, right, in terms of um, finding an equilibrium. If we are at point A in terms of capital, then our investment per worker is at C, our depreciation is at D, and so investment is higher than depreciation, so next year's capital is going to be higher. And that's going to be true until we get to this equilibrium point where investment and depreciation are equal. At that point, capital stock is going to be exactly the same next year as uh, it was this year because we're investing exactly the same amount as is depreciating. And so our equilibrium is going to be this point K star over N. That's our capital per worker equilibrium. And our output per worker equilibrium is going to be this point Y star over N. And the same thing will happen if we start to the right because if we're over here on the right-hand side, then depreciation is greater than investment. And so our capital stock will shrink. And so now we get pushed to the left, but eventually we end up at this same point. And so the idea here is that because of that concave production function and that concave, therefore, investment function and the straight line depreciation, we end up at this equilibrium point. So if we start out lower, we will increase capital per worker until we get to the equilibrium point. And if we start out higher, for whatever reason, uh, that will be less usual. Uh, then we get we decrease capital per worker until we get to this equilibrium point And we get to what we're going to call the steady state equilibrium here. So this steady state is going to be important, right? It's where the capital stock isn't changing. So KT plus 1 over N is equal to KT over N. So that left-hand side in our previous equation is equal to 0. And that means that our investment is equal to depreciation. So savings, S times our function of output per worker, is equal to depreciation times output per worker. And we're putting K star here because that's our steady state value. And then once we know our steady state value of capital per worker, we can plug that into our uh, production function and get our steady state value of output per worker. Now note, once you're at the steady state, output per worker doesn't change, right? Capital per worker stays the same. Output per worker stays the same. You need something else to change in order to uh, change capital or output, right? It could be depreciation changes for whatever reason. It could be savings rate changes. Uh, but something else needs to change uh, in order to change output per worker. Now, obviously, what we're going to introduce in Chapter 12 is this idea of technology changing, and that is going to lead to long-run growth. So that means that if we start out low in capital per worker, we would expect to increase capital per worker uh, pretty quickly, and that would increase output per worker. And this is exactly what happens when, um, you know, when we have a lot of destruction in capital, whether that's due to a war like this example in World War II, or a natural disaster, <clears throat> um, you know, whether that's, you know, a, an earthquake or tsunami or whatever, that capital needs to get replaced. That leads to higher investment. Um, that leads to higher uh, growth in 
capital per worker and output per worker. And so this is what we saw in France and frankly, in a lot of Europe um, in the decades after World War II uh, was that a lot of the capital was destroyed during World War II and therefore building it back uh, increased output. And French real GDP grew at 9.6% per year very fast um, in, in the five years after World War II. Um, so, you know, the U.S. was growing pretty fast, too, but not as fast and not for the same reason, obviously, because World War II, for the most part, outside of Pearl Harbor, didn't happen within the United States.